wait a minute. Does the sun move? The Bible says it does. Or does the earth move? Well, the Bible says it is immovable. We're, we've covered this. Uh, actual science, you know, observation and experiment demonstrate the sun moves as well as the moon and the stars. That's just fact. We see this every day, yet we are told not to believe our eyes, right? Don't look at what's in the other hand. The earth moves, though we can't observe that, can we? No. NASA has never observed that either. How about that? They create computer-generated images and uh, graphics that are not actually photos or video footage. Uh, in other words, they're fiction, make-believe. Uh, there's a big difference there. They have created their own paradigm against the Bible. See, that's the key here. Because they hate the Bible, they hate Yahuwah, and let's be clear, they hate you and your children. There you go. They offer little that is even credible on this topic. And we will vet some of that opening up here in this video. Yep, we're going to cover some science, folks. Here we go. Then we'll show you our animation of Enoch's charting the sun's course over 364 days. I know some say, oh, but Enoch doesn't propagate a sun calendar. That's stupid. Those people can't read. He only charts every day for 364 days, which always begin with the sun. Period. The end. I don't understand how so many have taken the book of Enoch and just taken it in so many directions that are not even there. Now, we test this further in Answers in First Enoch. We go into far more detail there. Uh, we'll show you those videos, uh, covers of them in a minute. But first, please indulge us for 90 seconds as we just launched our next book on the books of the Apocrypha, Volume 1, with Volume 2 coming very soon. Here we go. About 382 A.D., in the days of Jerome, known for the Latin Vulgate, a new term began to circulate in Bible scholarship, according to R.H. Charles. Certain texts of historical value, and even canon, were now labeled as something other than inspired scripture. The very concept is a clear redefining of books already in existence, and in most cases, text recorded as inspired scripture and Bible canon now somehow in question by those without any such authority. This paradigm remains today even further rooted as if it ever represented the historical approach to these Old Testament texts as some vet as truth. How do these texts stand up to the Torah test? The answer on many of these books will likely shock especially scholars who have never actually conducted such research, which becomes evident. It's not in their paradigm. This canon was already chosen before there were Pharisees in Jerusalem and before there was ever a Catholic church. Those factions do not get to legitimately form councils to vote on that which was already settled, fact, long before, even in archaeology. Get ready for a journey to restored truth on the books of Apocrypha from the 1611 King James Version. We publish this foundational research in Apocrypha Test as Volume 1 is now available free in ebook or one can purchase in print. Volume 2 will follow very soon. All links and announcements at apocryphatest.com. Test them for yourself and prove all things. Get your copy of Volume 1 of the Apocrypha today. It's free in ebook. It's free. So go download it, check it out, review this research for yourself. Uh, and it will blow you away. Volume 2 will be even more explosive, and it will be out soon as well. Uh, we will begin a new series uh, on this in time. Well, we'll probably wait for Volume 2 
uh, in, and then we'll just dive into the whole thing and rip through it. Uh, don't know if it'll be 52 weeks. We, we still are planning that, but it will be a pretty significant one, no doubt. It's a lot of books. Uh, in the meantime, we have tons more to cover in Restoring Creation. This narrative has been so misconstrued in modern scholarship, uh, it's not even recognizable. They don't even know the Bible. And it's, I wish I couldn't say that. I don't want to say that, but that is truth. Not in comparison to the original text, the Bible itself. Uh, which, by the way, does cover history and science. Duh. Uh, you know, we have accepted many things from modern occult scientism uh, where they push the Bible away and, and dismiss it very stupidly. I mean, it, there's nothing more ignorant than saying the Bible offers no history and no science. That's, re that's ridiculous. Uh, there's also no argument to be made that there's any book that precedes the Bible paradigm. There is none. Uh, the Bible is an eyewitness account to creation, and they offer what? Speculation, math in a vacuum, guesses that they can't even prove out to be more than what they call theory, uh, but it really should not, never rise to the level of theory because it fails simple tests many times. Uh, they label it science, but that is not science at all. Science is derived from observation and experiment by definition. Go look it up. Modern occult scientism doesn't apply that very often. Uh, not when it comes to creation science. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about somebody in a lab who's creating a product or inventing something or whatever. Uh, but see, these are based on poor guesses that they pile on top of each other. And the first one was usually wrong in the first place, so everything they pile on top of it has no foundation, and it's a house of cards. Uh, it's in a vacuum, and they rarely bother to test their so-called theories that still exist in textbooks, you know, like the one that says that the little Colorado River carved out the Grand Canyon over millions of years, yet the stupid idiots who wrote that textbook who refuse to remove it, can't even do a little bit of research to find out that what they're actually saying is that water would flow uphill and backwards. Illiterate. This is nonsense. Now, so their so-called theories many times fail, even simple tests. Now, what do I mean? I'm not talking about applied sciences, uh, such as an engineer working for DuPont or one of the innovative companies out there, especially even the drug companies, although that is, uh, well, pharmacia, which is the word sorcery in English. Oops. Uh, anyway, uh, they're actually inventing things, though, uh, using what they can repeat in experiment and observe. See, that's called science by definition, but that is not what the modern paradigm of this creation science category, the dunderheads like Richard Dawkins, who attacks Yahua, even in a book called The God Delusion. Uh, yeah, he is the delusion, and uh, his delusion will, don't worry, uh, it will disappear when he faces Yahuwah uh, and his eternal fire. Oops, that, that's going to be his problem. Uh, he's not going to have any good answers to those questions. Uh, so they're attacking Yahuwah on every level. That's what's going on. And we knew this, right? I mean, we've said many times this was prophesied by 2 Peter 3 that the foundations of the Bible would be assailed by whom? By scoffers who only care about their own lust. They don't care about you and I. They are not even honest men. They are liars, says Peter, okay? Those are his words. He calls them willingly ignorant. That's a liar, okay? Uh, their purpose is to undermine creation, the flood, and the deity of Messiah. And we are there, folks, even in Bible scholarship. Many, I'd say most, not all, but most Bible scholars do not actually believe the creation account and the flood account as they're written. They add to them, they take away from them, they try to explain away things that are very plain language that cannot be explained away because the Bible says what it says because they just don't want to believe it because they really want to. They desire to embrace this paradigm of fools, and that's what we're dealing with 
today. So somebody needs to deal with this, and we don't mind being the ones. We know the scrutiny that comes along, but for us, that's just another day. No big deal. In Answers in First Enoch, we chart what Enoch lays out as the course of the sun. Again, over 364 days, every day of the year, he defines gates for rising and gates for setting on the entire earth. Now, it's not for your area. These gates don't exist in every time zone. There, there are only rising gates in one part of the earth in the far east, and there are only setting gates in the west. Uh, and there is a space in between where the sun is carried by the wind. It's called a chariot, but it's a chariot of wind, uh, and it is propelled from that setting gate to the rising gate. Uh, in those gates, it's being fueled with intense heat at certain times of year or uh, less heat at other times. Uh, then he follows the track of the sun, which moves around the surface of the earth. He is a scientific eyewitness observer who was shown this, and he's credible because, see, he's the great prophet, and his book vets his truth. Oh, you got to read our publishing of it. If you haven't, don't even think about commenting, oh, that's not scripture. No, you just don't know what you're talking about. You haven't done the research, and the scholars you're reading most certainly haven't. We've already proven that Read the book, read the introduction for yourself, firstenoch.org. It's free in ebook. And heaven witnesses this every day since creation. See, there are eyewitness observers, scientific observers to the Bible paradigm, yet modern scientism doesn't have that. They are the speculators. That's the reality here. So backwards in our modern thinking. However, instead, we have generally accepted that people who spend a lot of time in school, well, I, I don't know, uh, did you go to college? Um, do you remember those, uh, many of them? Well, they just don't know what to do with their lives, right? Maybe their parents had the money that they could stay in school a little longer, but let's be honest, uh, many of them, not necessarily good students, but uh, well enough to pass, and that's all they need to be, uh, and, and they become, well, deeper, uh, PhDs, master's degrees, etc., because they were professional students. But somehow that has been positioned that they know more uh, than the Bible. No, they don't. That's ridiculous. That is illiterate. And that is a paradigm of fools. No, they will never know more than the Bible. They will never know more than the creator of anything, period, the end. So, Basically, they take a vacuum of knowledge, which is not science, uh, and, you know, basically they take away from the actual science and scientific observation of someone like Enoch, as we'll cover. And somehow, that's called edumacated. Yeah, right. For instance, observe for yourself the same sun since creation. That, that's what you see. Uh, running the same circuit since the beginning. That's what Scripture says, and that's how this works. See, we can see creation right now before our very eyes. How could any person, any human being, or whatever term you want to use for mankind, 
How could we possibly deny that there is a creator? It's amazing that anyone could. What we see is exactly as it was then in terms of the movement, the course of the sun. His course remains. Now our eyes sometimes even observe giant clues that really, really demonstrate this paradigm. Uh, like this, which scientism's worldview, oops, uh, fails to explain adequately. That's a problem, and we're going to show you this. See what you are observing in this picture here. It's a great photo. Uh, it cannot happen if the sun is 92 million miles away. You, you see, the, see these angled rays? Oh, whoops. It, you would not see them. If one was to trace the angle, which is called science, you would actually find the sun is far, far closer to the earth as it has to be in all of observation and actual science. That's called science and mathematics. It is what you observe with your eyes, which you can trust far better than modern scientism. However, we're told, ignore that. Ignore what you see and, well, listen to a bunch of dunderheads who hate Yahuwah and desire to attack him. Oh, what part of that is logical? Uh, none and no thank you. Let's look at another, though. We took this photo of the sun's rays uh, that we got from our art service. It's a valid photo, good photo, uh, demonstrating these angles. Uh, and we put it on uh, my Mac, and we followed the angles. And you see them there. If you trace them uh, back to their origin, and the, the actual degrees are, are there, uh, according to Mac, that's what Mac says the angle of that ray is, uh, which, well, cannot occur if the sun is 90-plus million miles away. That's not what you would see. You would just see straight rays, and they would be consistent. They would not be angled. That's a problem for modern science that they cannot explain. The Bible says the sun was placed in the firmament, which we have well proven is still there. So the sun is still inside the firmament to this day. It remains there and we see it consistently running its course. Creation is still with us, folks. Our eyes sense the sun moving, never the earth. That's because the sun moves not the earth. When modern scientism tells us to ignore our eyes and go with their math in a vacuum, well, that's just simply called witchcraft. Nothing up this sleeve, right? <laughs> now, watch my right hand. No, 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 just my right. Don't look at my left. Shh, shh, shh. Don't, don't do that. Yeah, right. That's not science, right? That's the oldest trick in the book. Uh, these same alchemists, or really sorcerers, make up almost the entire world uh, paradigm that we call science, yet it's all the magic of Disney, basically. Oh, you didn't know Disney is the origin of much of this teaching as well? Hmm. Yeah, go back and look at their old films, uh, even featuring the Nazi scientist Werner von Braun, uh, the one who said, uh, who headed NASA and uh, said that we could not possibly go to the moon. Yet, miraculously, not long after that, somehow they went to the moon. Yet, he said they didn't have the technology. Where did the technology come from? Maybe aliens? Uh, no, there are no aliens. A forced narrative and blatantly obvious when one watches even the supposed moon voyages, uh, shadows in three different directions, yet they claim no studio lightings, uh, lighting, uh, okay, so it seems like they forgot, yet they're scientists. Yeah, they forgot this simple basic. There's only one sun in this solar system. Oops, that's a pretty big oops. They could have provided indisputable proof, in fact, of their trip to the moon uh, with the original telemetry data, the actual data, basically the GPS data of the voyage, right? Oh, Oops, NASA lost it. I mean, the most important scientific journey in all of history, and they lost the evidence? This is just simply fraud. There's no doubting that. This is what they are teaching us in our classrooms, in trying to explain the different seasons 
especially the fact, which we can all observe easily today, that when it is summer in the northern hemisphere, while it's winter in the southern hemisphere, we all know this, right? Many of us have traveled to both and we've, we've experienced it. So we know that's fact, right? That's indisputable. However, this is a diagram from the California Academy of Sciences being taught to our children. Very nice because it's a lie. It's completely wrong. Notice they have, uh, you know, to tilt the earth uh, in order to try to make their math work. That's where the tilt comes from. There is no actual tilt that doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> however, their math still doesn't work with the tilt. Uh, and the earth has no such thing. Uh, and it's not a ball. Um, no, it's not flat either. We're not flat earthers. We never have been. Uh, we don't believe the earth is flat. We believe the surface is a flat round disk, uh, but it has an entire inner earth and infrastructure, including foundations underneath, and it is topped with the firmament, which is a rounded uh, top. So no, that's not a flat earth. It's a terrible term. Uh, it always has been. It's really uh, one of ridicule and ignorance, and we're not flat earthers, so there you go. Now, notice how the sun comes directly at the earth uniformly here, uh, which would have to be accurate based on its position according to them. See, the equator in the center there, which does almost appear to be explained uh, with this dynamic, but, whoops, not the extremes, uh, which caused this to fail horribly, and I'll show you in a second. Uh, it would have to be, uh, you know, if the sun is 90 plus million miles away, uh, it would have to be the case that the rays are pretty uniform and you would see no angles at all. By the time the light gets here to the earth, it would have to be uniform, period. Uh, that's just simple math and come on 90 plus million miles. That's an awful long Yeah, awful long journey uh, So no way that the light would appear to us the way that we see it if that were true Well, it's just not true to say otherwise would be unscientific uh, But here's the problem with this really truly flawed Propaganda, which is what this is. This is Yahuwah hating propaganda. That's what it is. Understand that Peter said so just for another supposed credible source here, this is what they call credible, this is uncredible, uh, here's National Geographic demonstrating the very same nonsensical propaganda. No, they don't show actual pictures, by the way. This is the way they teach our children. They do so with fictional ones that they create, and then they call that science. That's stupid. Come on, let's call the paradigm what it is. It's science fiction, perhaps not science. But check this out. Now, based on this diagram, the fraud is obvious here. How is it that scientists don't test their own charts? I mean, this is about as dumb as a scientist could get to even display this for the world to see. And yet they're teaching this as fact. And it's a lie. Uh, they love to criticize everyone else and everything else, even the Bible, even the book of Enoch. But they are the hypocrites. They are the scoffers pursuing their own lusts, and they do not care about us or our children. They hate Yahuwah, and thus they hate his creation, says Peter. See, it's there in Scripture. Notice in the northern hemisphere, uh, and this is July according to this chart. It's their chart, not ours. Uh, so accurately here, you experience summer indeed. Now that's fact. That's good. That part of it is truth. However, there's a big problem here. These idiots cannot seem to read their own chart. At the same positions opposite in the southern hemisphere where you would have the same exact sunlight. Whoops. According to their own stupid science. Though they label it winter here erroneously, uh, because they know that is what we observe, which is true. We do observe winter, but their chart does not, see? Because their chart's actually showing the same sunlight intensity as the northern hemisphere. In other words, their chart and the supposed science behind this ball proves false. See, according to this, 
regardless of their telling us not to look at the other hand, of course, uh, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, we're going to look anyway. Let's look. Uh, sure, they call it winter, but that's a false label uh, because it's not what the chart shows. The chart shows uh, in the southern hemisphere, it demonstrates in this July month that it's summer, just like the northern. Now, this is fraud and has always been false. Yet, this is what they're teaching our children. This is what we learned even in colleges and universities. The sun cannot be 90 plus million miles away, or this is what we would experience, right? And you wouldn't see summer in the Northern Hemisphere and then in the Southern Hemisphere, winter at the same time. No, you'd see summer all around in all of this space that's lit up there. They can't explain this on a ball because it's a false paradigm to begin with. When they made up the tilt of the earth, because it's fiction, it's made up by modern scientism, uh, originally they claimed it tilted back and forth or that it wobbled, basically. Then many retract that, or at least partially retract it, because they still say it wobbles. Let's call it what it is. They, they still say it does, all right? So, but they know it's a lie. That's the standard hypocrisy of the science world, uh, and we see it all the time, where they don't quite take the position away completely, but they go backwards a little, and you know, they actually still hold it, but they try to make it over you know, a longer period of time or water it down in some way that it, it can you know, at least work for some to accept, yet it still fails. That's the problem. Well, space, according to them in their paradigm, is a vacuum, and any such motion of something the size of the Earth would mean once the motion is started, well, it would never tilt back. But again, momentum continuing in the same direction forever. And in fact, now you have not just the Earth spinning in one direction, but you also have it uh, you know, toppling up and down over time. Uh, it's, it's just the dumbest paradigm ever, really. Uh, or in other words, utterly stupid to claim the Earth tilts in the vacuum of space. That's nonsense. Let's be clear, it still is. And they still have to say it because, see, their math fails. Unless they throw in a tilt, that is, which is impossible based on what we observe and what science tells us. The Earth does not move, the Sun and Moon do. See, that's the true paradigm, and that's what they try to ignore and suppress. How does this work, though? Well, we cover this in Error of the Moon, Part 4. Uh, then we uh, we'll also will play our animation here in this video of the Sun's course, uh, charted over 364 days in a nice animation for you, uh, which every day of the year begins with the Sun and never the Moon. See. Uh, we are picking this up from Answers in First Enoch, uh, where we cover this in great detail, far more than we're going to cover. This is just going to be a brief of that. Uh, but test it, even with the seasons, because uh, we do in the next video after that, and it vets as truth, where modern scientism fails. It even explains eclipses. Yes, we cover that. Enoch explains the dynamic of eclipses, modern scientism, not so much. Uh, oh yeah, and in that video, we established the criteria for the placement of these gates where the sun rises uh, and sets, uh, how they operate, how the sun changes gates uh, most months uh, and its course uh, all around. Uh, in the next video in that series, we then test the position of the sun uh, per Enoch with the seasons, uh, even in areas like the Philippines, and guess what? they test as factual. And the Philippines has some odd things going on in seasons that matches Enoch perfectly, but is a problem for modern scientism because it has a summer and then it gets a little cooler and then summer comes back. And that is not explained on a ball earth, but Enoch explains it very well. Ha, huh, how about that? Now this is from Rob Skiba. One can say whatever they want about the man. He's no longer with us, of course, and that's a sad thing. Uh, he may not always have been right about everything. None of us are. 
Uh, and we don't agree with everything that he ever taught, but the man was sincere and honest. No, you aren't either uh, right about everything, uh, according to Romans 3.23, so none of us are, okay? Let's just do our best. I know you may have heard this, and some think, uh, I thought I was wrong about something once, but I was wrong. Yeah, think about that. Anyway, Rob always was a sincere man since we ever knew him over the years, uh, you know, he pulled this out of Stellarium, as you see on the screen, software, uh, a few years back, and we thought it worth sharing. Uh, on this founded Earth surface of Enoch, that's what he's showing, uh, the sun would have to speed up as it approaches Antarctica, right? The, the outer rim of sort, uh, in its southern courses. And it would have to slow down when closer to the North Pole. Well, you know what? It turns out this actually jives scientifically, and you're seeing it on screen from Stellarium software, uh, which charts such courses and can project such. So there you go. This could also be observed in the sky, plain as day, literally. Uh, did you know the sun changes position, appearing to go higher into the sky, specifically at the hotter times in both hemispheres, opposite times of the year? Notice how these are opposites, in fact. Uh, it is at its highest point in the hot months, June, July in the north, and in the southern hemisphere, the exact opposite, December, January, it's at its highest point. The sun appears to form uh, a basically figure eight. Uh, if you chart it in the same position, they took photographies with photography with cameras, uh, compared year over year, day by day. That's how they created these. And this is pretty accurate and well attested scientifically. But what would cause this? Modern scientism would tell you, well, it's the Earth wobbling. What? Uh, you, what? <laughs> so they, what did they do? Well, their theory, theory failed, so they made up something else to try to make it work. They do this with everything. They do it uh, in space. They made up this concept called dark matter. No one's ever proved it even exists. No one's ever observed it. It doesn't exist. It's fiction. But they do it all the time rather than just going back and saying, you know what, that theory failed. This proves that modern scientism is fraudulent in their behavior, and they're not scientific. So, what would cause this, then? Um, obviously, if it was the Earth wobbling, um, again, you're in a vacuum of space, and uh, remember the tilt, you know, they stopped saying that it tilted back and forth. And then they said, oh, it tilts back and forth, but it's over 19,000 years. Yeah, right. That's stupid. This is not scientific. It's they're just holding on to these failed theories. It's so sad that they are so pathetic. Uh, and, and then, you know, go around touting themselves as the brainiac scientists when they're just a cult religious uh, believers who have faith in their religion. That's what they are. Now, they realized that the tilt didn't work, so they changed it. Now, you know, the tilt it, it, the tilt stays the same all year round, but no, it tilts every, what, 19,000 years. <laughs> That's laughable because it's hilarious that they go there and what they're doing is they're trying to stretch it out so far that then they can say, well, see, you would never notice that. Ah, oh, right. But see, there's a problem. See, because now they have to still manufacture something that causes this motion, that causes this figure eight in the sky. Because the sun doesn't move in their paradigm. So how is it that the sun is in different positions in a figure eight throughout the year? Their explanation the Earth now not only is tilted, but now it wobbles. What? Okay, this is motion in a vacuum. Understand that. What exactly stops it from continuing that motion and then causes it to wobble back in the other direction? It's a little different, but it's got the same problem. It's in the vacuum of space. They changed it for the tilt, so now they're going to have to change this theory too to try to make it work still when it's dead. However, 
This has always matched Enoch's concept. What he explains is exactly what you see with your eyes. What you see, what you observe, that's called science. It's called perspective, in fact. When the sun moves closer out of the gate, closer to your area, the sun is moving toward you, and it literally is, it will appear higher in the sky, just as a ship coming toward you will appear larger in your frame. That's the way your eyes work. It's called perspective. When it gets further away, it appears lower. In fact, it, it appears to shrink, just as a ship does when your eyes uh, see it. And that's when they say it goes over the curvature of the Earth. Yet, we now have more sophisticated cameras that reach much further. And even though your eye can't see that far, you can take your camera, you can still zoom in, and you can still see the ship. Therefore, no curvature. That's just fact. And you'll find that that ship did not actually disappear. It just did in your perspective. Now, there are numerous examples out there. We're not going to go and test this. It's been tested by many. Go check those out. You can find them very easily, especially on the Flat Earth channels. Uh, but it's called perspective. Your eye sees what it sees. This pattern of the sun is called an anathema. And this is the routine pattern your eye will see in observation. It is the movement of the sun, and it is science. The sun moves. Here is an example. This corridor appears uh, that the opening closest to us is much larger. And then it appears to get smaller and smaller as we see further away. But is that actually happening? No. Focus on the doorway at the end of the hall. Is it actually smaller? Why, no, it's not. It just appears that way in perspective. It is the same size as the opening nearest us, as you'll see as you walk closer. Uh, this is a function of our eyes. It's called opt optical perspective. You are not actually seeing the door get smaller. It's not disappearing. It's still there. It didn't disappear over the curvature of the earth, did it? And the building is not built to incline and decline with such curvature, is it? No, never, ever has any building been built that does so. In fact, also proving that the earth does not have such curvature, period. You know, the hallway is flat and level, or the builder is not very good, of course. Now, modern science has another lousy answer for this one, as they have to now not only make the Earth tilt, but they have to claim that it wobbles. Made up fiction. Talk about confirmation bias. They can't prove that the Earth wobbles. No one can see that. And that's why they hang out there in these theories, in the things that can never be proven. That's where they are. And that's not science. They alter their theories then when they realize they fail rather than throwing them out, which is what they should do if they were actually scientists, and they are not, let's be clear. Starting over with actual logic, yeah, that's the way science is supposed to work. They modified uh, and did away with the theory, uh, instead of doing away with the theory, uh, that the Earth tilts back and forth, uh, except, of course, now it's over tens of thousands of years. So they still do claim it, but really uh, minimize it over a very long period of time no one can measure. They still need it, and it's still a lie. And this is what they do. They live in the margin of error, uh, which we'll someday cover in maybe even multiple videos exposing the science world, which is very stupid on some of these things. But now they claim the Earth wobbles since, well, they can't tilt it anymore, at least not in in a year period uh, every year uh, because that failed so this is where it is actually very easy to catch the fraud I mean just just look at the history of it just as with the tilt if the earth wobbles in space once that motion begins in one direction well what is the God or force that stops it and causes it to go in the opposite direction as well a motion that cannot happen in space unless, uh, well, the Earth has rockets 
Uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, so, and evidently it does this many times. So what would cause such a wobble? Well, where is the evidence of such? This is why they go to, you know, an, uh, an, uh, even from an oblate spheroid to a pear, which by the way, someone said, no, Neil deGrasse Tyson says it's an oblate spheroid. No, we have a clip actually of him. We can't show it because they'll be in our video. Uh, we're not allowed to use clips, even though the Fair Use Act says we can. But we could show you the clip of him, which actually he says that it is an oblate spheroid that actually is pear-shaped. Uh, below the equator is is wider, broader. So, yeah, he still says it's a pear. So, uh, that's what he says. And, again, that is the third paradigm of the shape of the Earth since we supposedly went to the moon and photographed it, which wasn't a photograph. So... I mean, you know, it's it's called fiction, and uh, when they don't agree with themselves, we take it and we test it, and that's what we should all do. Where is the evidence? They use circular reasoning and claim that this anathema is evidence. They're actually using it as evidence, uh, yet they need to prove it ever happens in the first place. That is not evidence of a wobble. It is evidence of perspective, optical perspective just as we're showing you here uh, if it was true then you could apply it but they got to prove it true first otherwise they are not propagating science and it's not true see this is stupid it fails it uh, as does the tilt that we already showed you in previous videos these are massive problems for modern scientism proving it is merely propagating an occult religion not science and that's our position science is observation and experiment and they have done neither on these points and represent the opposite of what we observe and that is a massive fallacy that is because they are religious zealots of great faith in their paradigm their occult religion of willing ignorance just as second peter 3 warned for our age he said they would attack creation, and oh boy have they. The flood they undermine with fiction, and supposed ice ages they can't prove ever existed. They're using evidence for the flood that they're trying to reframe as, oh, they had to be ice ages. That's stupid. Marine fossils don't move in glaciers. Come on. Use your brain, science. They wave their hand in witchcraft, telling us we don't see what we do see, and they ignore history, the Bible, and many other texts. All 364 days, let's begin now. Abib, the first Hebrew month, the start of the year. Uh, Abib 1, mid-March, essentially. And the month goes mid-March to mid-April on our Roman calendar, roughly. Uh, that's what we, we see and needs to be reconciled each year. It changes on the Roman calendar. It never changes on the Hebrew calendar, which is always consistent year in and year out. Now, we already know the sun begins in the center in the fourth portal. We just read that before. Are these portals perfectly positioned that we drew? Well, we didn't observe this. Enoch did, however, but... This is a pretty good representation. Verse 8. When the sun rises. Oh, wait, what? Oh, you mean it starts when the sun rises. Yes, exactly. In the heaven, he comes forth through the fourth portal, 30 mornings in successions, 30 days in this month, and sets accurately in the fourth portal in the west of the heaven. Understand, uh, Hebrew months have 30 days, there are four months of the year. At the end of each quarter, you'd add one, what he calls an intercalary day. So one day at the end of each quarter. So it's 30, 30, 31. 30, 30, 31. 30, 30, 31. 30, 30, 31. 30, 30, 31. There you go. So he comes forth through that fourth portal, 30 mornings in succession, and sets accurately in the fourth portal in the west so understand he is rising in the fourth portal but he's also setting in the fourth portal and understand that then there's that that portion of the day in between the west and the east gate and that's where the sun shifts at the end of most months to a different portal and that's how we get the change of the seasons verse 9 
And during this period, the day becomes daily longer, and the night, nightly shorter, to the 30th morning, consistent with science. Uh, they were just even as you will at the end, um, you'll see. The, the last day of the year is the spring equinox, we'll, we'll get there, uh, the true one, by the way, not the fixed one on the Roman calendar, which is unscientific, uh, by any measure. Uh, they're, they're not really, they're just attributing a day each year. Uh, it's close, but they're not actually trying to find the equinox. Uh, many people try to use that data, and the data is just not good. It's, it's from, from the start, so they won't find it. Verse 10, on that day, the day is longer than the night by a ninth part. Now, man, does he get detailed here, right? And the day amounts exactly to 10 parts and the night to eight parts. Now, that's 18 hours, right? Or 18 parts of the day, but from the east to the west gates only. See that? That's, that's what it says. Now, you must then add the six hours of sun and moon proportionately to whichever their measure is for that particular month for the return trip from the west gate then back to the east gate and that's not there in that map uh, it's assisted by a chariot of the wind right and so it's it's there are multiple things uh there and again that's where it changes course sometimes too into another gate at the end of a month Enoch never says that a day is 18 hours, uh, and he never says that an hour is an hour in 20 minutes or whatever that would be. His perspective also is not one of standing still in this whole thing. Understand that. He's still, uh, you know, he's watching the sun, but he's following its course around the entire earth here. That's what he's trying to do. He's not standing in one place seeing the sun go overhead, so that's not the perspective from which this is written. The second Hebrew month, called Zif in Scripture, um, if you see another one on the modern Jewish calendar, that's Babylonian, don't use it. Uh, it's basically mid-April to about mid-May, uh, verse 11. And the sun rises from that fourth portal and sets in the fourth and returns to the fifth portal of the east, 30 mornings. So 30 mornings, it rises in the fourth, sets in the fourth, and then on the 30th, it changes. So that was a beeb. Now it changes further north to the next portal at the end of the month. And this is consistent with what Enoch shows regularly uh, most months, not all, but most. And rises from it and sets in the fifth portal. So this month, the second month, rises in the fifth portal, sets in the fifth portal. Last month, it was rising in the fourth portal further south. Understand that. And setting there as well. And then the day becomes longer by two parts and amounts to 11 parts. And the night becomes shorter and amounts to seven parts. Again, if you looked at this and you said, oh, well, but, you know, I live in Australia, a lot of our viewers do, and, well, wait a minute, this doesn't work. Well, no, you're in the Southern Hemisphere. It does work because Enoch's not talking about the perspective of standing in one spot here. He's talking about the course of the sun, right? How the sun travels. That's all he's talking about here. This is consistent. However, with the coming summer in the north, which is where he's heading here, because it went north to the next set of gates. Obviously, in the southern hemisphere, that's, that's going to be, you know, winter. It's going to be closer to the winter. So that makes perfect sense uh, in observation, if we just understand Enoch's perspective here. That's all. The third Hebrew month, unnamed in Scripture, uh, we don't use the Babylonian one, or at least we shouldn't. Uh, that has nothing to do with the Bible. Yes, there are times when Scripture uses the Babylonian name in reference to a king of Persia or a king of Babylon, which is appropriate. That does not then change the Bible calendar and start using, especially something like uh Tammuz, the sun god? Yeah, right. What a crazy name for modern Jews to use in utter ignorance. But anyway, mid-May uh, to mid-June, roughly, uh, on the Roman calendar. Verse 13. 
and it returns to the east and enters into the sixth portal. So now it's, it's rising further north in the sixth portal and rises and sets in the sixth portal. So rise, set, both sixth portal, one and 30 mornings. Well, we're in the third month. What do we do? Every three months, we add a day at the end. Now we're 31. On account of its sign, that's what the intercalary day is. It is a sign, according to Enoch. But he treats it separately, even though, of course, it's a part of the calendar, and that's how we arrive at 364 days as opposed to 360. Four months have 31 days. The rest have 30. Verse 14. On that day, the day becomes longer than the night, and the day becomes double the night, and the day becomes 12 parts, and the night is shortened and becomes six parts. What we know for sure, whether we can even do this math or not, which is highly complex to even try, and I don't know that anybody will ever get it, but what we know for sure is this is May, June, and in the north, hey, we're entering the summer months. We're getting close to it. So as we're approaching summer, of course, the day goes longer, uh, and the nights get shorter. We know this. I mean, it's easy to test, but we're going to test that more next. Now, the fourth Hebrew month, also unnamed in Scripture, just the fourth month, uh, mid-June to mid-July, roughly on the Roman calendar, 30 days. Uh, as all of these months, by the way, every single day begins when? At sunrise, never based on the moon. Period. If Enoch then goes and says that elsewhere, then he just doesn't agree with himself, right? So no, you can't go into the moon part and find that. And you won't, actually. We're going to cover the moon, so we'll get there. Verse 15, and the sun mounts up to make the day shorter and the night longer, and the sun returns to the east and enters into the sixth portal and rises from it set and sets 30 mornings. Okay, so we've got... Now, the sixth portal, uh, and 16. And when 30 mornings are accomplished, the day decreases by exactly one part and becomes 11 parts, and the night, seven. The fifth Hebrew month, also unnamed, mid-July to mid-August, 30 days. Verse 17. And the sun goes forth from that sixth portal in the west and goes to the east and rises in the fifth portal. So that was uh, the previous month, the fourth month there in the sixth. Now we're in the fifth portal for 30 mornings and sets in the west again in the fifth western portal. So rises in the fifth, sets in the fifth for that whole month, 30 days. Verse 18, on that day, the day decreases by two parts and amounts to ten parts, and the night to eight parts. The sixth Hebrew month, again unnamed, just sixth month, mid-August to mid-September, 31 days now, because we're in the sixth month, we're in the second uh, quarter at the end, where we add another intercalary day at the end. So the days again, uh, right there, uh, 31, and we're back to the fourth portal again now. Verse 19, and the sun goes forth from that fifth portal and sets in the fifth portal of the west and rises. Okay, so that was the previous month. Understand that's how Enoch writes this. He's a very smart guy. He's brilliant, and it's amazing how detailed this is, and rises in the fourth portal for one and thirty mornings, thirty-one days, uh, and account uh, on account of its sign again, the intercalary day at the end of each quarter, uh, where we add one more day, and sets in the west. On that day, the day is equalized with the night. This is the fall equinox, where day and night are equal. The true one. Many charts online. Uh, you know, don't actually follow the true equinox. Uh, so it, it's easy to get sucked into that and you look it up and then you try to make calculations mathematically based on that and they, they don't work. And then some even try to use that to ridicule the book of Enoch. But it's 
all nonsense. It's not actually the true fall equinox, number one. Number two, you need to know the perspective from which Enoch wrote. What, where did he live? Uh, you know, what would he be talking about in terms of area? And becomes of equal length, and the night amounts to nine parts, and the day to nine parts, equal. Again, there are 12, 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of sunlight, I mean, I mean of, of, uh, of night. So uh, there's no doubt that that would be the case, but because the return journey, again, which would be calculated proportionately, uh, isn't added in this calculation. The seventh Hebrew month. Now, these are the fall feasts. This is one of the most important months of the year. Uh, you have Abib. Uh, of course, you have Shavuot, which takes place in what they call Sivan, which was really just the third month. There's no Sivan in Scripture. Um, and also, this one is 30 days. Uh, the name of the seventh month is there in Scripture. It's called Ethanim, never the Babylonian name. Now, we now go to the third portal. Uh, this is September, October on the Roman calendar, if you're following through. Verse 21, And the sun rises from that portal and sets in the west and returns to the east. Okay, so again, that's, that's from the previous month. And rises 30 mornings in the third portal and sets in the west in the third portal. So we're going to rise in the third, set in the third this particular month. Uh, and on that day, the night becomes longer than the day, which is consistent with what we see in certain hemispheres. Again, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're the opposite, but that's no surprise. We all know this. And night becomes longer than night and day shorter than day uh, till the 30th morning. And the night amounts exactly to 10 parts and the day to 8 parts. The eighth Hebrew month of Bull, uh, October to November, uh, mid uh, of each month. Uh, 30 days, all beginning at sunrise, yet again, consistent through this whole narrative and this whole chapter, and really the whole book of Enoch, and the whole of Scripture, and the book of Jubilees as well, which all are Scripture. Verse 23, and the sun rises from that third portal and sets in the third portal in the west and returns to the east. Now, again, that was the previous month we saw already. Ethanine, now move on to the next. And for 30 mornings, rises in the second portal in the east. So now we're in the second portal. Again, changing the last day of Ethanine the previous month. Enoch is very consistent here. And in like manner sets in the second portal in the west. So rise in the second, set in the second uh, of the heaven. Verse 24. And on that day the night amounts to eleven parts and the day to seven parts. Again, that is only from the east to west gates. Enoch does not record the return journey time frame in that math. Yet we know there's another six hours there uh, for the total for the sun and moon. Uh, in their courses, and they would remain proportionately to the rest of that calculation. The day is never 18 hours, nor 18 pods of time, but 18 hours plus the return of the six hours between the sun and the moon. Yes, this can get complex uh, if, if they try to make it so, yet this is pretty straightforward, and it's not hard to understand. We can figure this out. Uh, we get that, you know, sometimes that can be confusing, but it doesn't have to be uh, if, if you just take the view that, number one, Enoch doesn't disagree with himself. That's a big thing many do with Scripture. They have, you know, Yahusha disagreeing with himself so many times in the modern church. Uh, it, you, can't, you can't count it on your fingers and toes and <laughs> uh, your whole family's fingers and toes and many thousands more for that matter. However, let's keep the proper perspective here. Again, we are going to get to the moon. Don't worry. Uh, we are going to test this some in the next video as well. And one thing here we'll mention, notice the distance becomes greater, but variables such as the speed of the sun's course are just not recorded here 
you know, it doesn't say that. Uh, he probably didn't have a speedometer, so he couldn't quite measure the speed of the sun, nor does he have to. It would be really, I mean, it'd be nice to have it, but we don't need it. The data here is awesome as it is. So again, try to debate that as a point, which isn't really a point at all. Be muted. Our channel, our rules, we just ain't playing along with debate in ignorance, especially not for things that we cover in the video. And we find people trying to debate things that, well, number one, we don't even say. And number two, you know, we, we've covered and already obliterated the debate many times over with many scriptures. So they just didn't watch. So clear the sun uh, is powered uh, to propel at different speeds and it is infused with different amounts of fire each season burning hotter at times cooler at times Enoch accounts for this the ninth Hebrew month again unnamed in scripture November to December middle of the month to middle of the month 31 days because we're in the ninth month the third quarter uh, as we add an intercalary day at the end of the quarter again Enoch is consistent. Verse 25, and the sun rises. Whoa, that starts the day yet again, doesn't it? On that day from the second portal and sets in the west in the second portal and returns to the east. Okay, so that was actually the previous. Uh, into the first portal now for one and 30 mornings. So 31 days, that was bull the previous month before. Now we're into uh, the first portal and 31 days. And sets in the first portal, so it's consistent, in the west of the heaven. Uh, it shifts to the first portal now for this entire month. Verse 26, and on that day the night becomes longer and amounts to the double of the day and the night amounts exactly to 12 parts and the day to 6. Again, this is November, December. We're getting into winter now and this makes perfect sense. Uh, again, in the northern hemisphere, of course. Again, only from the east to west gates. The return trip is not here uh, and must be added uh, in number mathematically. The 10th Hebrew month. We're getting through this. Unnamed. Uh, it's mid-December through mid-January, basically. Again, needs to be reconciled with the Roman calendar. Uh, 30 days total. Verse 27. And the sun has therewith traversed the divisions of his orbit. It has completed all six gates at this point on both sides. So all the gates it's entered. Uh, so they're all represented and that's all he's saying here. The east and the west which we have observed at this point if you followed all the way through. And turns again on those divisions of his orbit. So basically he's going to head back in the other direction. Um, and enters that portal uh, meaning uh, north-south not East West, he always it always rises in the east, sets in the west. Of course, I, don't, I shouldn't need to mention that, but I know for some I do. Or there'd be a blog about how we don't know, right? <laughs> Idiot. Anyway, and enters that portal thirty mornings and sets also in the west, opposite to it. So there is no migration to a different portal this particular month, and that happens uh, some, but that's the rarity on this whole calendar. So that's in the beginning as it remains the first portal for the rising and the setting. Verse 28, and on that night has the night decreased in length by a ninth part and night has become 11 parts and the day 7 parts. The 11th Hebrew month, again unnamed, uh, mid-January to mid-February, 30 days. Verse 29, and the sun has returned and entered into the second portal in the east. No, it was in the first, moved again. Uh, and returns on those, his divisions of his orbit. So he turned back around in the other direction, north to south, um, or really south to north, uh, for 30 mornings, rising and setting. And on that day, the night decreases in length, and the night amounts to 10 parts, and the day to 8 again plus the return journey proportionately uh, for a total of 24 hours, as must be in order for Enoch to get to 364 days. There's no other way to make that work, folks. 
Another 30 days where the sun rises first at the start of the month and day. And then the 12th month of the year, the final month of the year, the culmination of the year, basically mid-February to mid-March, which brings us back to a beeb in about mid-March. Uh, again, it changes on the Roman calendar. Um, the Bible never starts in the year uh, in January. just doesn't. Uh, it also, there's no such thing as Rosh Hashanah in the fall. That's stupid. Uh, it's always been stupid. The word Rosh Hashanah is only in the Bible one time, referring to Abib uh, as the head of the year, which is always the head of the year and never changed. That's the Babylonian calendar that they try to insert, just as they do with the lunar part of it. So, um, it, frankly, the day never starts, uh, the day, the week, month, or year on the moon. It cannot. It doesn't work. And you've just seen Enoch uh, tell you this over, what's, 364 days. So it's kind of hard to conclude anything else. But always the sun. You can see that here, 364 times. Enoch is clear about that. And he really can't be taken out of context. Never once does he ever allude to the day beginning with the moon. That's Babylonian nonsense from the synagogue of Satan. Let's stop listening to the rabbis. Let's follow the words of Yahusha. He told us who they are and what they represent. They turned Torah against Torah, even in this respect. Now, that's Mark 7, 9, if you haven't read it. Now, Enoch is adding the one intercalary day here at the end of this month, once again, because it's the 12th month. Uh, he'll tell you that this concludes the year at 364 days, never 354 days. He will do that math under the moon to show you that it's wrong, an error, and that the, the year comes in 10 days too soon. And he even shows you over two years and three years and five years and I think eight years. So he keeps going to show you the math to say, hello, see how far off this gets? <laughs> uh, it's so obvious. And by the way, Jubilees rebukes this in the very same vein, in the very same way, with the very same math. So it's 364 days to a year. The year follows the sun, never the moon. The moon has a purpose. It is a measure for some things, but it is not a measure for days, weeks, months, or years, Sabbaths of the years, or even Jubilees. Verse 31. And on that day, the sun rises from that portal and sets in the west and returns to the east and rises in the third portal for one and thirty mornings. So now we've shifted to the third portal and sets in the west of the heaven. And on that day, the night decreases and amounts to nine parts and the day to nine parts, consistent with science, consistent with what we know. Again, the perspective of Enoch is not in the southern hemisphere. He's not down in Australia, so don't try to put him there. He's not there. And the night uh, is equal to the day, and the year is exactly as to its days, 364. That's it. Got that? 364 days is a year, period. That is the Bible calendar, according to Enoch and according to Jubilees, both. Really, according to the whole of Scripture, and we've gone through many such verses and really proven that out at this point. Read Rest, the Case for Sabbath, if you have not. Available free in ebook at restsabbath.org. There's a whole chapter uh, on this uh, concept. Verse 33, And the length of the day and of the night and the shortness of the day and of the night arise, through the course of the sun, these distinctions are made. They are separated literally. So the moon doesn't even determine the length of the night. Get that? The sun does in its rising and setting because it is the measure for that, not the moon. Understand that. Enoch is clear the sun is the measure, the timekeeper, that's what's important here, for the starting of the year, the month, the day, here throughout this passage. Uh, he doesn't mention the week, but that's obvious, because if the day starts at sunrise, the week starts at sunrise. I mean, if the month starts at sunrise, the week starts at sunrise. I mean, you can't really uh, come to that by any other conclusion. And, you know, in testing the moon, the moon is off even for the week. 22 of 52 Sabbaths uh, last year when we tested that, uh, which is ridiculous. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. Verse 34. So it comes that its course becomes daily longer and its course 
nightly shorter. It's all about the sun, folks. The moon has a purpose, but it's not the timekeeper for the start of the day, week, month, or year. Uh, it cannot be, and this is why you will find Enoch will rebuke it uh, following, uh, for just, just as Jubilees does, uh, outright. Really, so does the whole scripture. Again, even Messiah's death and resurrection still entrench the same exact timeline. Apply this timeline to that. Go back and read it. Go back and read how on earth could he rise on the Sabbath and yet just before sunrise and then it was the first day at sunrise. How does that work? Well, it works if the day changes at sunrise. Duh. I mean, it's not real hard. It's just that many scholars don't want to believe that. They would rather believe the Pharisees. Well, they can have their Pharisees. Go enjoy your Pharisees. Put them on a pedestal. Enjoy that. Those of us who want the truth and want to know what the Bible really says, well, we reject that. On the last day of the 12th month, we have the spring equinox, equal day and equal night. Okay, 12 hours, 12 hours. However, not 12 hours and 30 minutes. No, no, 12 hours and 12 hours, very, very closely uh, associated. Uh, this, when we discover it truly, is the measure for the end of the year, and the new year starts, Abib 1, the next day, not on the equinox, but the day after. That's what Enoch says. Now, on modern charts, this is assumed the same Roman day every year by many, which is false scientifically, unfortunately. And they do this. They, they love to uh, confuse us and deceive us. So you'll find all kinds of data out there, uh, especially on different websites, uh, which is not accurate. It's not that it's, it's terrible for them to say the equinox is always the 20th of the the, you know, of March every year, but it's not. It doesn't work. Uh, it, that, that's not true when you look at the amount of, of daylight and, and night for the days in partic particular. It shifts uh, on the Roman calendar, which is the key. Enoch also warns, uh, I mean, they're, so they're using faulty data from the start, and it's hard, to, it's hard to, to then reconcile. And then again, some will then turn on Enoch and blame him for faulty data that they've been using uh, being a false litmus test. Enoch also warns, though, and remember this, in the last days, the time will change, in fact. We may not be able to even reconcile this today based on our modern data. Might not. Uh, they also would need to understand Enoch's perspective. This is huge. I mean, you just go and grab an equinox. Well, the equinox isn't the same everywhere on Earth. That doesn't work. Uh, it moves uh, depending, you know, in date or at least time and hours, uh, depending on where you are on Earth, for that matter. So you have to know exactly what area he would be referencing as his perspective. Now, likely... And again, we don't know 100%, though likely, uh, he would use the Philippines, which is ancient Avila, where Noah tells us in 1st Enoch, the righteous generations from Adam lived. Many use their own, but don't pretend that represents Enoch. It doesn't. You know, there's a whole lot of junk out there regarding this, and you can discern for yourself. Is this video perfection? We don't aim for perfection here, folks. We strive for excellence. And we ain't perfect. We're human, and we always will be. Uh, do we make mistakes? Uh, yeah. Well, you find a video every now and then where, oh, on that one slide, they made a math error. Oh, well, just throw out everything they ever said then, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's pretty stupid, but there are bloggers out there. Finally, in addition to the seven videos in Answers in First Enoch, for full detail, all right, if you really want to know, go there and watch. Try to debate without watching that. Be muted. That's our channel, our rules, folks. Sorry, but that's the way we operate because we are done with all of the ridiculous trolling and, you know, crap you have to deal with on YouTube, and we don't have to put up with it. Now, which uh, we did not cover here, by the way. We didn't cover the detail. We just gave you a quick brief here. But if you want to understand uh, when the Bible day begins uh, as well, uh, you'll never find it in Judaism, nor especially Messianic Judaism, uh, which is still Judaism, by the way, uh, and they use the Babylonian lunar calendar. Notice Babylonian, not Bible. Uh, the Bible never propagates such, and we prove this 
uh, in massive detail. Watch uh, When Does the Bible Day Begin series. It's about 28 videos. Uh, so no, we ain't playing. And that debate is over, finished, done. It always begins the day on the sun uh, in the Bible and never the moon, not even once. Affirmed uh, many times, so many ways, but especially by Enoch hundreds of times. Got that? Uh, now we cover the Gospels. Uh, which clearly entrench a solar calendar uh, in that series, even with charts, so check it out, uh, and you'll find the Bible day there has always been well documented, especially when Yahushua rose. Uh, yes, one must look at each passage, and when it is talking about, for instance, Pilate, the Roman calendar is likely invoked, and appropriately so. No problem with that. You shouldn't be saying that somehow that means that, you know, Luke didn't know what he was talking about, or John, you know, evidently is following a different calendar. Uh, duh, he is. He's following the Roman one when he's talking about Pilate, because that's Pilate's calendar. How is that so difficult for scholars to figure out? Who knows? The problem is they don't realize there's three calendars at play in the New Testament. You have the actual Bible one, you have the Roman one, and then when it is speaking of the Pharisees, uh, even Joseph of Arimathea in his case, and yes, he was a holy man, uh, he was a believer, there's no doubting any of that, but he was still a Pharisee, uh, and he followed the Pharisee calendar. It is clear that he did because it invokes in his account uh, the lunar calendar in contrast with the solar calendar in much of the rest of the texts. It's so obvious. We cover that in detail. Again, we chart it and we make it very easy to understand. Uh, just takes a little research, which scholars have not done. We've never seen a scholar arrive at this conclusion, and it is so very obvious. Uh, not one single one. Yes, the feast uh, with an evening start uh, even prove the day changes uh, because the date does in their calendar of observance. Hello, they say so. That's what the Bible says. We cover them too uh, and chart them for all to understand. Uh, neither of those days begins in the evening, just the feast does, in only three of the seven cases, the other four started sunrise. So even that is a factor. Four beats three. Hello. <laughs> uh, one feast was an historic event, and the other atonement uh, always ends in cleansing in the evening in Scripture. That's what the Bible has always said many times over. However, their dates, according to their passages, change at sunrise in their observances. And we prove that out and chart it, you'll see. Uh, no one can get around that. No one can debate it. No one has, uh, not effectively. Uh, yes, the creation account most certainly begins with light during the daytime, says Yahuwah, if you believe him, of course. Uh, so anyone claiming the creation day started at night, well, simply can't read plain English, uh, or any language for that matter, uh, that the Bible is written in. And that goes for those calling themselves Bible scholars uh, who just simply can't read. Uh, it's, it's a paradigm thing. They can't read because they have glasses on that block them from being able to understand this. We cover all this in a massive, massive number of passages in which tomorrow comes in Scripture many times Old Testament and New, at sunrise, never at sunset, because that is the Bible paradigm through and through. As we covered in Jubilees, which is very accurate to all of Scripture, the sun is the measure, the timekeeper, for days, weeks, months, years, Sabbaths of years, Jubilees, and even the four seasons. Pretty much sums it up. Uh, we have affirmed all of that very solidly on so many levels. Watch it. Uh, there is no debating this position. You'll find that pretty quickly, uh, though some still try, uh, and their response is typically, nah -uh, uh and they'll throw things out like, well, you know, Nehemiah uh, closed the gates uh, at sundown. Well, wait a minute. Where did you see in the passage that it says the Sabbath started at sundown? Because it does not. Uh, do you not understand that the actual practice 
uh, of, of merchants uh, who have booths and sell fish and other things that they would sell at that time is they come in at night in order to set up and sell in the morning. Hello. So if Nehemiah waited to close the gates until the Sabbath started, he would be ineffective because they're already in there. They're already set up, they already have their supplies, and they're going to sell their goods. See, it's nonsense. And it is a standard Jewish position to throw out just stupid things like that that don't make any sense. They can't even think. You would think Jews would be able to as merchants. They can't even think about the situation and the practice involved. They ignore that and say, well, see, this says... No, what it actually says is he closed the gates at sundown the night before in order to stop the practice because that's what it would take in reality. Uh, they say, no, uh Sirach says, oops, uh, well, they forgot to read Sirach. See, that's the problem. Uh, they say he says something and they don't even bother to read the context because just a few verses before he addresses the moon, he actually defines that the sun is the measure of the day's beginning, not the moon. He tells us it's more significant than the moon, not just larger or any of those things. It's more significant because it is the time keeper. You know, they come at us with, for instance, the Sefer Bible, and we prove the Sefer committed gross negligence using a very poor older translation with R.H. Uh, Charles, you know, had corrected. And they should know because they claim they read, you know, or they read Charles's, Charles's uh, book as well uh, and used it in their interpretation, yet they did not, uh, especially in that instance. Uh, they ignored his proving that their translator, and he says so, it's right there in his notes, we cover this. Uh, their translator from 100 years before him uh, did a very poor job. They actually took the word moon from the previous sentence, and they move it into the next sentence. And what do they do? They replace the word sun with the word moon. That's called fraud, folks. <laughs> Call it what you want, but that's called fraud. It's, it's either such poor translation, whoever translated that is no translator, uh, or it is blatant fraud, and it seems to be on purpose. Not from the Sefer, but the point is they prefer that Judaism position of the moon, so they propagate that, and they didn't correct it, even though R.H. Charles did. Now, we point this out very well with the actual explanation uh, of R.H. Charles, and he is right, uh, and his translation far more accurate than that older one uh, that he corrects many times on many things. You will also find other times that they replace sun with the word moon. That's, I mean, talk about backwards. That's massive error. Uh, and But see, the problem is they did not change it always. And even their translation says the sun is first and the start of the Bible day multiple times. So in doing so, they actually create a conflict in their own text and their copy of First Enoch is corrupt as a result, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't. I wish we could say they uh, had committed to fix it, but we, we haven't heard a word. Uh, they do the same with Jubilees, uh, so this was an obvious assault uh, by their translator, not them necessarily, though they are still continuing to propagate the, the fraud, really, changing the text, and that's inappropriate. So there you have it, some review uh, of the movement of the sun from Enoch especially and things we've covered. Uh, the Bible has always taken the position that the sun moves and not the earth, and we've covered so much on that already. Uh, but watch those series and you'll see for yourself. Uh, the Bible is not antiquated, and its thinking is not antiquated. Modern occult scientism is the one who is antiquated. See, they're marching us back to the doctrine of the Nephilim and their fathers, the Watcher Fallen Angels, from thousands of years earlier, which Enoch even rebukes specifically regarding the sun, moon, and stars. The Book of Jubilees tells the account of uh, our foxhead son, Canaan, who found the doctrine of the Watchers regarding the sun, moon, and stars carved on a rock, and that became the basis of Babylonian worship and really rebellion against Yahuwah. Not good. That is what they are teaching 
It's rebellion is what it is uh, in our schools. And you can watch our videos on that. Uh, we have doctrines of the watchers. Uh, I think in part one and two, if I remember, uh, within answers in First Enoch, check that out. Uh, that he, he details them, so you can see for yourself. Astrology is one of them. Next, we'll explore the idea laid out in Genesis 1 of Moedim, or Bible feast days, since creation? What? No, not all of them, but there are some that began even before the flood and at least two uh, very close to the creation period. Wow. This is precious, and this restoration is going to be amazing. This will be incredible. We'll prove it out. Don't worry. We have over 500 videos on this channel. Wow, 500. Yeah, boy. Imagine that. Many just as profound, uh, with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos, uh, six in Spanish to start. Uh, we also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube, well, they just forget to notify often, uh, conveniently. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. Uh, we have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Player, formerly Utreon. They've changed their name just recently. Uh, and our podcast is also available for most of our videos as well. All links in the description box. Friend us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space original. If you prefer an alternative, we have Gab and Parlor, though it was just bought out as well and hopefully will be up again soon. It's not right now, or at least not as the recording of this video, but links below. We have seven books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries, uh, and we're progressing towards our next releases very soon. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, and U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon, and it is available in hardcover.